Hi, everybody. Welcome. We'll just wait another minute or two for people to arrive. Thanks for coming along. Okay, let's get started. So I'm Sophie, I'm the Head of Professional Development at English Australia, and I have the pleasure of hosting today's webinar with Dr. Masaki Shibata. Um, so Masaki is very qualified to be talking to us today about beach safety messages. He's a linguist and a lifesaver, which is quite a rare but lovely combination. So thank you for joining us today, Masaki. Um, Masaki is a researcher at Monash University in Japanese political and media discourse, as well as beach safety, especially for newly arrived migrants. He's also a surf lifesaver at Tamarama Beach in Sydney, and I believe he's saved somebody this summer already. Um, and he's been a swim coach for about 10 years. So thank you, Masaki. Over to you now. Uh, thank you very much, Sophie, and um, thank you everybody to join uh, my talk today. And I'm very excited about um, talking about my research, but also this topic is really, really important, I think, especially for um, those who arrived in Australia, but also um, those who actually educate, um, you know, um, for example, teaching English to newly arrived migrants. And so hopefully that my talk can help, you know, people. Okay, so my presentation, the title is Swim Between the Flags. I should stay outside the flags because I can't swim. So international students miss interpretation of beach safety messages in Australia. So I would like to start with um, some of the literature. So um, I'm a part of also a member of UNIS, UNSW B Safety Research Group. So um, uh, that group is led by um, Dr. Uh, Professor Robert Branda, and he's also called um, Dr. Rip in Australia, but also in the world as well. So he's really, really famous. And so I'm working with them, and they produced a lot of, a lot of, a lot of advanced studies um, in the beach safety. And so uh, these studies are actually um, from some of them as well. And so um, international tourists, and so especially from China, Germany, and Japan, and United Kingdom, are more frequently around the beaches than in other lo uh, locations in Australia. And so now a lot of studies start looking at a little bit of more specific nationalities and also the migrants. I mean, so far that we know that Australian beaches are so dangerous and a lot of people unfortunately die. And but now we're looking at that it's not just Australians' problem, but then I was actually almost half of the beach goers, um, you know, who die in Australia. It's in fact it's actually from uh, different countries. So, um, you know, this topic is really relevant to anyone in the world. And also, you know, beach, um, uh, beaches are most common location of drowning for migrants who have lived in Australia less than five years. Interestingly, if the migrants live more than 10 years, that they actually found that uh, lots of migrants drown in the beach as well as river. However, you can imagine the sort of short um, stayed migrants, they um, often have a trouble with beach. And then when you look at the migrants, and then um, the record of 2009 to 2019, so the 10 years, more than half of the migrants who drowned were from non-English speaking countries. And that was really, really important to address. So top nationalities were South Korean, Taiwanese and Nepalese. So now, um, you know, there was a question, OK, is that something to do with the language? Um, I'm not really sure. So um, however, that this study really, you know, made me curious about it. Um, OK. But there was another question. So uh, why I'm actually jumped into this topic is because when I was doing a PhD in linguistics at UNSW, I started um, doing the life saving at Tamarama Beach in Sydney, which is one of the most dangerous beaches in, in Australia. And when I actually start taking the bronze medallion course, uh, which to be a, you know, uh, to be a qualified lifesaver, I was listening to the trainer and 
And I couldn't actually understand some of the language that he was using it and explaining the, all the, the, the motion of the waves, you know, um, for example, current, rip and tide and swell and waves. And I wasn't sure what the difference, uh, you know, um, between those languages. I mean, sorry, those terms. Now, um, and then, okay, the language is a bit so complicated here. Um, do even people understand beat signs and stuff like that? Or whatever the lifesaver actually telling them, do they actually understand? So now like my curiosity is even bigger and bigger. And then um, I was talking to um, my Australian friends and interestingly that even my Australian friends said that the language of the beach is, I think it's quite complicated for Australian as well. Um, and then he said, well, you should definitely, definitely, you know, explore more on that field. Um, you're a linguist, you can try it. And so I basically, um, you know, with my linguistics um, background, but at, some time, at the same time, I learned all the different methodology to look at the different data and learn the more quantitative analysis as well. But anyway, where to start? So I actually decided to interview um, 20 surf lifesavers um, in Bondi, Tamarama, and Gwenelg Beach in South Australia. And um, because I wanted to see a little bit of a difference between, you know, two different states as well. And then just, you know, hearing their voice. What is your experience with international, you know, for example, tourists or migrants? Do you find something special or different? You know, and then from there, um, whatever that they said, I just wanted to test it, whether it's actually applicable to many people or not. So then I actually did a little bit of a quantitative study, which I'm going to talk about. Okay, so first I interviewed 20 surf lifesaver in Bonda and Tamarama and Granagua Beach. And it was actually really good to actually hear a lot of, um, you know, voice from surf lifesavers because they are the one who um, uh, carried out lots of preventative actions. So when I'm doing the lifesaver, uh, life saving at the Tamarama Beach, I'm usually smell something. Okay, some people, okay, this this person looks very dangerous because the way they approach the water, well, you're standing right in front of the rip current. So we know that we sort of smell it. And so then we usually, you know, talk to them and say, well, don't be here, um, just move to this side and stuff like that. So they are the one who actually um, interact with beach scores quite a lot. How, in this study, I found something really, really interesting. So one of the Korean lifesaver actually said to me, um, I will share his actually story that when he arrived in, in Australia, he saw the red and yellow flags. But in Korea, in red and yellow, usually that color indicates danger. So he actually deliberately avoided um, a flags area. And then he actually caught in the rip straight and he was rescued. And then he wasn't sure why, like, what's going on? And then that's how he actually ended up being a lifesaver because he wanted to know what these flags means and as well as other dangers. So it was actually a really interesting story, you know. Then um, one of the lifesaver in Granog also shared really, really important study. Uh, sorry, important information. So one of the tourists came to, um, to the lifesaver and um, asked, um, sorry, what these flags mean? So red and yellow flags. So the lifesaver um, responded uh, saying, um, oh, that means swim between the flags. And then um, tourists look at the lifesaver and it had a three seconds pause. So that means I should stay outside of, outside of flags. And then lifesaver was like, why is that? Well, because I can't swim. And then actually, Lifesaver never thought that, about that interpretations for like, she lives in Australia, like, you know, entire her life. And she never thought that swim between the flags can be interpreted in that way. And now she thinks that, okay, well, true. I mean, even walking in the water in Australia, it's called swim between the flags. So, mm, wow, what is going on? 
And so this story actually now gave me more curiosity that is that the way that people interpret the flags or even signage or the language that you see on the signs? Is that how the people actually interpreted it? So then um, one of the lifesavers actually said, some lifesavers believe that some signs require the cultural knowledge to understand. Yeah, truly. I mean, some of the signs said blue bottle. Do people actually know blue bottle, even if they are from not Australia? And so that all different sort of things are, you know, um, uh, came out from this, you know, topic. So it was really, really interesting that, um, you know, whatever that I was learning from the lifesavers. Oh, by the way, I'm so sorry to um, to, to address this. Um, I'm sorry, I should actually have said that very early. <laughs> Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please ask me and you can just unmute and then straight to ask me. It's a little bit harder for me to look at the message while I'm actually talking. So if you have any questions or a, um, anything that you would like to even share, please let me know. I'm happy to, you know, um, to hearing um, your questions or your thoughts. Yeah. So please interrupt me whenever you have questions. Anyway, so then, um, okay, so whatever I got those information, what if I ask beach boys in Bondi, what your interpretation of those like famous terms, which is swim between the flags. So um, I, I, so then I conducted a quantitative study. I went to the Bondi beach and talking to people and I did a survey. And to be honest, I talk over 500 people um, actually during the Omicron explosion, which I was like, it would be a hard time. Um, um, at the end of the day, um, 167 um, respondents that I got and, you know, who completed a whole survey. So then uh, this study actually found that um, um, in terms of um, swim between the flags, uh, sorry, about 30% of the beach goers thought that actually if you are not swimming or you're playing, wade, uh, walking or something like that, stay outside the flags. So whatever the, that tourist um, said in the Gwenaug, um, that was actually 30% of beach goers' interpretations. And that was actually quite shocking. But at the same time that um, in Bondi, there are lots of backpackers as well. Um, so um, another thing is that there is a sign say no flags, no swim. And so basically no flags and the equal mark, and then there's no swim. And then 50% of them actually thought that, well, if you don't see the flags, that means you should not swim out or maybe you know don't go to deeper area but you can still go in walk maybe just up to the knee or something like that but recently um i saw the news that um there are two people in the palm beach that um basically um they got into the water but up to the knee so basically they were walking um but they were swiped out so and then they died so um, there are some cases that even though you're not going in, you just put in the um, you know legs or just even um, up to your knee, um, people can die in Australia. So there are lots of danger are there, even if it's just going into the water. So but also, you know, other than those really famous terms or very iconic terms, so many similar flags, but there are lots of different language used. For example, high surf, blue bottle, shore dump, shore break, marine stingers. You see that those um, terms on the public signs on the beach. And do people actually understand them? And then, um, Approximately 50% of overseas born beach cores, they said, I have no idea what high surf blue bottle show damp means. Okay. 
So basically, that you know, this this study once this study was published, and um, it was actually um, uh, reported in SBS World and also was SBS Japan and the Italian. And um, so, um, yeah, so some of the news um, agencies actually reacted to it, well, which is really good because then uh, people are more likely to read the signs after reading my news articles. Um, however, there are more curiosity there because then what if they don't actually speak English? Um, they are more likely to rely on the pictorial information as well. So uh, last year, in, in a collaboration with UNSWB Safety Research Group, uh, we conducted a similar study, but more uh, more testing, and um, also looking at the picture, um, um, uh, people's interpretation of pictorial information. So basically, the icons, signage icon, and then. Um, uh, also, we focus on university students because they are responsible for uh, about 25% of the um, cost of drowning by rip current. And then um, also another thing we wanted to look at is when the people said, yeah, yeah, I understand those signs, I understand those signage terms, then we wanted to actually ask, all right, what is your interpretation then? So when the people say, yes, I understand, and we wanted to know what their interpretations are. So we ask them to write down what their interpretations are. Um, yep. But also now we start, you know, okay. So people actually misunderstand signs of like, you know, always when we jump the flags, but do even, do they even understand surfers? Do they, do they actually know that, Surfers should stay outside the flags because surfer and the swimmer, if they actually you know in the same place, that's really dangerous. So um, there is a term called a fin chop. So the basically surfboard has a fin on the um, under the surfboard, and the, sometimes the surfer goes to the swimmer, and the fin hits the human's body, and that gets really huge cut. So there, um, it's called a fin chop, and then you, um, it's really dangerous, to, you know, mixing those two bodies. So, the when you put the flags out, surfers have to stay out flags. So the people are actually protected from the surfers as well. But I'm not really sure if the people do know about it. And then, um, yeah, so we actually asked that question as well. And then at the end of the this, um study we also looked at the word the translation of Japanese and Chinese of those terms you know that was another curiosity so um we surveyed with 220 Australian university students uh, most of them are actually from uh, New South Wales and South Australia and then um, 136 domestic students and for international students and yeah please don't worry about those uh, methodologies um, I'll show you um, the data. Uh, hopefully that this now it, it, it's visible for you. It's hopefully it's not too small. So uh, in terms of always swimming between the flags, um, we put these multiple choices. A is that everyone except surfers should stay between the flags, which is correct. So and then second one, everybody including surfers should stay between the flags. So um, and then number three choice was only swimmers should stay between the flags. So stay outside flags if you play way or something like that and then as you can see as i highlighted um almost 50 percent of even domestic students australia like uh, most of them are from australia domestic students even think that surfers should stay between the flags that's incorrect and this data really tells us that um, people do not know the purpose of the flags at all so they don't know why we have flags. Flags actually avoid dangerous current, rip currents, and surfers. Um, unfortunately, we can't really do the sharks, I would say. But um, yeah, so those like obvious danger that is avoided by the flags. And yeah, they don't know about it. And then 21% uh, of international students also thought that, again, if they can't swim, stay outside the flags. Yeah, that's really dangerous. And um, also knowledge of signage terms. 
And so we tested high surf, voodoo bottle, submerged object, shore dump, and shore break and rip currents. And I'm just curious whether how many of you know uh, these terms, actually. These are actually public signage. Even some of them are in Bondi Beach. Do you guys, do you guys know these terms? Um, yeah. Um, I think this might be a little bit complicated terms, isn't it? But anyway, so let me explain what it is um, first. So high surf is basically that wave is really really high so um basically that it's 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 really dangerous because then if it's really high that means you can crash on you and stuff like that and then blue bottle is actually it's not technically speaking it's jellyfish but um it is um uh commonly um known as a jellyfish um uh, so that blue bottle is there is it like you know floats and um and it's there's a long tail and if you touch that tail it's like it gets stung and so it's really burning. I will show you a picture later. And then submerged objects um I mean typically speaking I think it's more like a reef or rock. I mean can be some sort of you know shipwreck and stuff like that. But uh, mostly more um yeah reef or rock. And then shore dump, that's this kind of term. So basically that when the wave gets really high, sometimes it doesn't go like, like uh, go down like gradually. Sometimes wave goes super high and then you base that crash onto the shore straight down. And so that's why you might get dumped by the wave. So it's called a shore dump. And a short break is the same. So the wave actually goes really, really high and then wave suddenly breaks. So it doesn't like gradually go down, but rather just breaks and then crash onto the shore. So the danger of this one is that basically you got on the wave and you're like really having fun, but then suddenly the wave crash you onto the shore. And then there are some spiral injury or basically like sometimes break the neck, uh, bones and stuff like that. And then uh, rip current. So rip currents is basically the current goes out. So usually that current goes to the shore, right? But one of the currents actually goes out. And often around the rock as well. So basically when you go onto the rip, then sometimes swipe. So basically go to the deeper area immediately. And then some of the rip currents are in fact faster than Olympic swimmer. So if you accidentally got onto the rip, then a really, really bad one, there is no way you can come back straight to it. So you have to avoid um, the rip currents or just swim parallel to the shore, or you have to some you have to float. Um, and then because rip currents that goes out and then kind of comes back around. So, um, yeah, but anyway, so these terms are really, really common. And so this is all I can show you. Um, how many people don't understand it? Even domestic students, you can see it that, for example, short dump, short break, over 50% of the domestic students have no idea what they are. But as you can see, um, show that the international students, 83% say, I have no idea what it is. But show that is on the Bondi beach. So um, there are lots of um, things that are going on. So, yeah. Oh, uh, thank you, Anne. Yeah, I didn't know some of the show. Yeah, so I was surprised that these are used in um in the public signage. Yeah. Okay, and so, but then now let's look at the when the people say, yeah, yeah, I understand those terms. Or well, let's ask them their interpretations are. So, um, one of the uh, students actually said the blue bottle is kind of fly, and I was like curious, why is fly? Well, I'll address it a bit later. But anyway, so then shore dump. Again, um, a lot of them actually thought that the shore and dump, so that's a, a sewage waste, a pollutant on the shore. Uh, is that dead fish, seaweed, um, needle, can? So you can see that the dump was actually to, um, realized as more like a rubbish rather than, you know, dumping waves. And shore break 
is also that you know short break is um it's basically you know wave goes up and high and breaks it right but then lots of them actually thought that um sorry not a lot i mean a few of them actually thought that basically it's current basically split to the right or left no that's not the short break um so even some of uh one student said rest on the sh beach so <laughs> basically short break having the break on the shore so but then again like you know it's surprised that you know how the people interpret it but in terms of english in terms of semantics in terms of the meaning yeah, it's possible to understand that way, right? Then uh, let's look at the um, um, signage icons. So the basically pictorial information. So number one is this one is slippery area. So it's more like on the rock or, you know, uh, it's a little bit more outside of the water. And then uh, this is like some magic object and this is shallow water and then high surf. So you can see that the wave is really high. And then and this is a dangerous current. So then there are actually two types of pic, um, uh, picture of dangerous current, but this one is quite commonly used still. Um, so as you can see it, um, even domestic students have no, 50% uh, of them actually have no idea what, um, what this picture means. <laughs> but then I would like you to actually um, think that this data is really, really important, especially for those who come to Australia and some of them actually don't speak English, right? And then they go to the beach and look at those pictures instead of language, then that's what happens. So one in two people don't understand this picture means. And I think this these can be used in a mountain as well, some of the slippery area. So um, it's really, really important um, to actually understand and dangerous current again is 66 percent of international students do not understand what this um yeah picture means so that means that 66 percent of the people who can't speak english would not understand what this means so then um but also let's look at the okay some people say yeah i understand actually this picture oh, well let's ask and what's your interpretation then and quite a few of them actually said that a sudden drop of sea floor or point of get deeper or rough water or swampy sand. And I realized some of them actually look at this picture as the situation in the water as, instead of outside. So they didn't actually realize that there was a motor that was like a cliff or rock or anything like that. They thought that was actually inside the water. And that's not what I what it meant. But also dangerous current, as you can see, how to call for help. So they're doing the two ones. But then I actually think that this is a little bit dangerous. Well, what kind of people can actually raise two hands together when you are actually drowning? I'm a water polo player. Even one arm is really hard. Both hands, I can't do it. That's why I'm not goalkeeper. Um, it's really hard. So it's actually not necessarily correct way either. And it's sharks. So you can see, like, some people think that there was a shark under this water. So, um, yeah. Uh, sorry, it's okay, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And then, so, yeah. So then, um, all right. So these things are what's happening, right? And then at the same time, what happens if you put these terms into Google Translate and what's going to come out? And then, so this is Japanese. So I can show you the blue bottle is translated as blue bottle. I don't think people do understand. I think people do more likely to understand uh, blue bottle, like blue colored bottle. And there is actual Japanese terms, which is katsuo no eboshi, which I assume that not many people understand. But um, there are some Japanese terms, but no, it's not there in Google Translate. Also submerged objects, like it said sunk objects. So sunk objects, as if like something actually went down into the water. I, I wouldn't actually realize that's reef or rock, but also kaigan dampu. So kaigan means shore, so that's correct. But dampu, I have no idea what the dampu is, but we knew, we know one word, we use the one word in Japanese, it's called damp ka. So we said damp ka um, when the rubbish bin, sorry, the, the the truck comes and then collecting all the like in you know, a rubbish. Yeah, we can call it dump car as well. And hence that if you see the dump, I think a lot of people do realize that's more to do with rubbish. 
and then short break, short break. It's like a prison break, isn't it? So it really didn't make sense. And this is the Chinese. Um, and so one of the colleagues from um, Chinese department, University of Adelaide, and helped me um, when I was in there. And so, again, even short break is just having the break on a shore. And um, shore dump is basically um, the place you put the rubbish on the shore. So, again, there are all misunderstood, uh, sorry, mistranslated in Google. And you can imagine the Google Translate is one of the most popular translation apps, which, in fact, it is. So um, we can't actually proactively have to say that do not use Google Translate to actually translate those signage terms. Um, as educator, we have to say that don't use the Google Translate. Yeah. So this is actually a summary of what I actually explained. At the same time that this has been um, in the news media, and I wanted to show you this media because it's quite interesting how the people reacted to those signs. 11 people have drowned in our state. Tonight, there's concern about the effectiveness of safety signs on our beaches, with misunderstandings putting lives at risk. A trip to the beach is a pretty simple concept. You swim, relax and lay on the sand. But new research suggests when it comes to surf safety, the warning signs aren't as straightforward. Even some people believe that they understand the signs, but it's actually um, understood wrong way. We put that to the test at Sydney's iconic Bondi Beach. What does this top sign mean? What's the top sign mean is that you always need to uh, swim between the flags. Oh, if, if we, we don't have the flags, we can swim. Yeah. Fine to swim? Like, like uh, um, not, not a strong current or not very wavy? Ah, save, help, isn't it? If you're in trouble, you meant to wave? Is that what that's asking? It means dangerous current. Ah, see, I did not know that. Slippery? <laughs> Yes. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, no, you, you've got 100% it, it, so far. It is uh, confusing. <laughs> Do you know what a blue bottle is? Is that a dolphin? <laughs> it was very painful. I got one, the only one on the beach uh, two days ago. I still remember. It can seem like fun and games from the shore, but getting it wrong in the surf can prove deadly. 11 people have now drowned in New South Wales this summer, including Father Seti to a Pepe at Penrith Beach, where there are calls to increase lifeguard numbers and roll out water safety campaigns. Despite this research, these signs won't be changing anytime soon. Instead, it's all about education and explaining what they mean when people arrive at the beach. It can be a little hard to translate into a, a whole lot of different languages, but what we try and do is interact really proactively with everyone who's coming down to the beach. First, it's definitely the education and also, I guess, some more advertisement, and that's something that we can actually do. In Bondi, James Wilson, Nine News. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? So My and all we do, um, apparently there is a bottle nose dolphin, so a lot of people actually think the blue bottle is it. Um, it's dolphin as well. Um, so then, um, of course, that the you know previous study shows that um, a workshop by the experts are very very useful and effective. And in fact, I run um, the workshop uh, um, uh, at the Macquarie University and as well as RMIT University yet, uh, last year as well. Um, however, that they can be a little bit costly and time consuming. And so, what actually can we do? You know, to educate um you know people on a beach safety so current study we are actually doing so how can we deliver water safety messages without any financial human support but i also realize that a lot of risky beach goers actually not don't think that they are at the risk so um how can we actually teach them without their primary interests in the water safety so um currently our team and so i'm leading this project as well that we were developing ielts preparation materials and incorporating beach safety information so um a lot of uh, migrants um actually taken ielts but also um very recently the um, department of home affairs um 
uh, change the criteria for IELTS. So a lot of university students, even after graduation, they have to take IELTS to stay in Australia. So if we created free materials and incorporating beach safety, they can may, may be able to learn. Um, so this is something that we were trying to see if that this method can work because they can simply study English from the IELTS, but maybe unconsciously learn the beach safety. So this is one of the example I can show you. Um, we're still at the development stage and doing draft and reviewing and stuff, but we are more focused on the uh, reading passage. If you're interested, please let me know. Um, and um, yeah. Anyway, so the lastly, as I said, uh, I have run this couple of like, you know, beach safety workshop, but I thought that it might be more interesting if um, I give more, a little bit of more research perspective, uh, beach safety workshop. And so I will show you what kind of information I have given to Macquarie or RMIT university students. Um, so for example, I talk about how many risk people um, uh, focus on the death number of the death. No we have to actually look at how many people have been rescued, carried out, how many people actually did not die because of the name. So that's also really important to address. But also, how many people dying by shark? Because a lot of people are about shark, 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 but it's only like 26 people um, between the 12 years. and But 230 people by rip currents. And then people will probably more focus on, sorry, what is rip currents, you know? And so, of course, I give you a little bit of more um, information about how to survive from the rip currents and stuff like that. But I also bring some studies to collect all of the realistic voice. So that these this study actually show the voice of survivors, uh, rip current survivors. It's really emotional, but which is really great. But also when I talk about shore dump, what happens, you know, so for example, I show you the data of the, basically the number of the ambulance called. As you can see, Kuji Beach, um, they called ambulance so many times. Do you know why? Because uh, Kuji Beach is very famous for shore dump beach. And lots of people have a spiral, basically neck injury. Um, so um, that's, this is what could happen. And again, the blue bottle, what is a blue bottle? And I'll show you like, you know, one in six Australian people actually got stung. And I'm like, people were like, what is that? And um, and then also, you know, it's already study has been done. What kind of beach is more likely to get the blue bottles? And uh, what about in in terms of Sydney? It was like on Marubra, Crovelli, Coogee, which one I get most, you know? At least you can actually sort of imagine what it is and stuff like that. And so, um, yeah, so this is the, uh, this is my uh, contact. So I just started my position at Monash University and very excited. And um, ah, sorry, the very last things I wanted to show you is this one. Um, so um, 28th of December, City Morning Herald released news about my study, but also um, uh, we collaborated and we developed the quiz. So they featured me as well. And, but most importantly, we made a quiz here. So um, you can use it if you have any students. So, you know, what is your interpretation? Oh, that's correct, but that's wrong. Or like, oh, that's correct and stuff like that. You know, so um, you can simply use it and you can check the scores and the stuff like that. So if hopefully this is useful materials for you, um, yeah, if you can contact me, I can just share the link or you can just Google Masaki and Sydney Morning Herald will come out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Yeah. Thanks, Masaki. Um, if you do have questions for Masaki, he said, uh, please just unmute yourself and ask them. So it's quite casual. Uh, feel free to ask a question verbally or if you prefer, pop it in the chat. Yeah, I can say originally a uh, great idea and original language barrier and absolutely did not know also. <laughs> yeah, um, interesting, um, um, Breen. Um, actually, I, when I was serving in Bondi, I met a couple of Americans there and they were like, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> like, it's, I think it's some Canadians that are like, yeah, I don't even know what these flags means. And I, America has a lot of different variations in terms of the flags as well. I think... Florida even used a purple color, which I, to be honest, I don't know what it is. So, <laughs> yeah. And 
and um, also team less interestingly, I've no international students businesses in them. Um, uh, smoke next to the blue green smoke green. Yeah, so again, um, smoking is like interesting things, isn't there? It's a lot of like science says there's no smoke, and it's even universities. Um, and lots of like ban of smoking, but yeah, it's a little bit of cultural, yeah, knowledge, isn't it? Think very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. If does anyone have any questions, um, please let me know. I'm happy to discuss or talk. Yeah. Um. Actually, safety second language is mainly migration. Yeah. No problem at all. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. If anyone has any questions, like you can just simply ask. Don't be shy. <laughs> would Would anyone, um, if you don't have a question, would anyone like to share how you cover beach safety at your college with students? Yeah, I actually really, yeah, interested. I'm actually interested how you can cover beach safety. Yeah, because you know language must be involved and. Um, when we are providing the beach safety, I I don't have anything to add, but I was I work actually at TAFE, and I wondered what your suggestions for covering beach beach safety would be, and and whether you come out and give talks, or you know anyone who would, or yeah. So I mean, it's um. I'm happy to actually um, come in and give you a talk um, if uh, if the, your company is happy to. Um, yeah, and you can just contact me later. But at the same time, that if, um, and there are some body, like for example, self life saving Australia and in terms of Victoria and Victoria life saving, and as well, I saw is Royal Life Saving. So there are some um, famous water safety bodies are there as well and they are really trying to especially yeah trying to actually help um, newly arrived migrants as well so if you can approach them they might be able to help you as well um, but also um, um, when my another my suggestion is when the for example school decided to give their own um information about the beach safety we want to be a little bit cautious how we give for example swim between the flags you know but it doesn't actually work right and there we have to for example um keep advocating to the um in the in the public that we have to change stay between the flags we should not say swim between the flags anymore because there are lots of misunderstanding um always say well be careful with blue bottle and then the students probably may not actually react to anything but they may not actually understand what you said so that sort of things that we want to be a little bit more cautious about the language itself yeah that's another suggestion i'm happy to yeah make yeah thanks thank you larissa um do you comments um thank you <laughs> Uh, very brief chat where they are told to swim to an uh very brief chat where they are told uh no, actually well if they haven't told uh haven't been told by anyone else it, there must be more public signs and then to be really honest uh, most of the um drowning in Australia is actually happening on patrolled beaches so in other words that like um, a lot of people basically having to travel at the beach that there was no lifesavers. So in that case, that they might actually see more public signs. And so, um, Brent, to be honest, I never covered this as a sales teacher at TAFE. Uh, me neither. I mean, unless I, uh, until I find out these um, outcome, which was 2020, I did not even think about it. And then to be honest, I presented at the Water Safety Conference in Australia, but also World Conference as well. And people were like shocked, but people at the same time realized that, yeah, that's not working. So I think there's a lot of um, water safety um, uh, groups are also really working on a signage. And then, um, yeah, Victoria's Life Saving um, also contacted me and we talk about the signs and together. So yeah, it might be a very new area that we actually never 
thought about it. Mm. Can we have a PowerPoint in our email? Yeah, if you can contact me, I'm happy to share. Have discussed recurrence in the class as well. Great. Yeah, please keep doing. Yeah. Um, recurrence are really you know, recurrence is one of the main reasons. Although you know, uh, there are more reasons, um, which was actually found out through the research, which I mute, yeah, I typically cover that kind of things in my workshop. And hi, Kumara, yes, I shared that a little bit. Ah, yeah, thank you. I don't think we have covered it without the uni, um, international team might. Yeah, Tim, I mean, that's a really true. So I'm approaching a couple of universities as well and um, previous uh yeah um some of the university doesn't have a capacity to do that and also yeah that's why i'm hoping that our ielts project can work really well um mm. uh work and life yeah it's a fantastic students. idea the ielts project because as yep. you say there's that you know challenge of if there's a workshop will students turn up are they ready yep you know, to hear that information at that point in time or are they just overwhelmed? But I think um, the embedded approach is is really effective with the smaller group in the classroom. Yeah. And I think, it, uh, Betta, um, are you from Victoria Lifesaving? Hi, Masaki. Yeah, I am. Oh, great. Yeah, yes. thank you. I know that um, it's... Um, um, Barnett is the one that who uh, worked on the signage very first place and I was inspired by her work and then I just took over into more different ways more like sort of uh, linguistics ways uh, so hopefully we can work together because I know that you are working on a signage at the moment right so I had a, a talk with Alex as well so excited <laughs> yeah fantastic no it's great to hear I'll let her know we we love your work and we're always really inspired by what you do so yeah we'd love to work oh, together thank you thank you thank, thank you, you. Well, Masaki, I think um Grant just has a question in the chat um okay. he really likes the quiz that you've developed and he's oh, asked if um they can only access it through the Sydney Morning Herald article or if there's another way um yeah, for that quiz is only Sydney Morning Herald article. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, we we drafted it together, but uh, yeah, um, and I, yeah, I don't know if you can. You have to pay to access that article. I think it's that article seems you can actually access without subscriptions. Yeah, if not, please let me know. If, I could just ask them if there's anything I can do. Well, thank you so much, um, Masaki. There's a lot of very positive comments in the chat for you to read, which I'll give you time to read before I shut down. Um, but I think everybody's found this extremely useful. And, you know, obviously we've learned what a minefield beach um, signage and language is uh, for our students. And, you know, all of those examples that you gave of the way that um, the messages were misinterpreted seemed so logical to me. Um, and even the example that one of our attendees put when they looked up what a blue bottle was on Wikipedia. And again, it wasn't, you know, what we know as a blue bottle. So we can see how there is such potential for confusion and that your work is extremely important for the safety of our students. So thank you again. And thank you to everybody for coming along. Oh, thank you, Savi. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>